The unsurpassed, penetrating and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand myriad compass. Now we can see and hear it. We can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha. Homage to the Dharma. Homage to the Sangha. I'm going to attempt to talk about consciousness. And uh, <clears throat> also about relative truth and absolute truth. We don't talk about this very much. This, this whole book, How to Grow a Lotus Blossom, is the, the diary of Master G.U.'s uh, experience in 1976 and 77. And I've been reading a few, um, revisiting some of the people who've had near-death experiences. And they're able to see that the near-death experience is um, the same as a religious experience. Um, the problem with near-death experience is it doesn't happen very long and people don't know what to do with it. <laughs> and this, her Master Jiu's experiences, it, it goes on for months and she has incredible teaching in here. And uh, unfortunately we don't have this book in print at the moment, but um, hopefully it's going to be available soon as a, a print-on-demand book. Relative truth and absolute truth. In the first chapter of the uh, Shurangama, the Buddha asks Ananda, where is the mind? And the Buddha is asking from the point of view of mind with a capital M. And Ananda is answering with a mind of small m. So there's, there's not a lot of real communication there. And he, Ananda came up with about six different places, uh, or at least six. <laughs> and each place uh, the Buddha destroyed says, no, that's not it. <clears throat> well, the point is, this mind absolute mind has no location and uh, some of the near people who are studying near death experience are they're, lo they're looking at it and realizing that it's like um, quantum physics the things in quantum physics they, they can exist but they don't have a location and this is the same with uh, absolute truth or the Buddha mind it doesn't have a place. It's everywhere. <laughs> Just as we're talking about in the ceremony this morning about Samantabhadra, every dust mote is a manifestation of the Buddha mind. Everything is a manifestation of the Buddha. And it's only our lack of perception or our, our perceiving things through um, the eyes of self that we don't see the Buddhas everywhere. Um, I frequently told the story of Yakusan, who had been studying with Sekito. Sekito is the monk that wrote the, the Sandokai. Um, and he'd been studying, I don't know, 20 years or something, and he wasn't getting it, and he was getting really frustrated. And he um, finally, Sekito says, go on and see my friend Basso. And he tells Basso, you know, that he's, read everything he could on Buddhist, Buddhist practice. He studied with Sekito for 20 years. He's been a monk for 20 years, and he's still not getting it. And also just looks at him with a little grin on his face and says, well, you know, sometimes I raise the eyebrows and bring, blink the eyes of old Shakyamuni, and sometimes I don't. And sometimes it's good to do, and sometimes it's not. What do you think? Well, at that point, um, Yakuzan, the penny dropped for him, and he realized that he had been trying to get something. He spent 20 years thinking that there's this enlightenment he has to get and hold on to. And he doesn't realize that he already has everything he needs. But he hasn't been looking through the eyes of the Buddha. He hasn't been able to see that because this concept of inadequacy 
and thinking that he needs to get something was in the way. He was filtering everything through this, I don't know what this is about. <laughs> and if you spend your life saying, I don't know what this is about, well, that's what you get. I don't know what this is about. <laughs> If you spend some time seeing your fundamental goodness and the goodness of everything around you, it enables you to change how you see things. And this shift in perception is what allows us to go from the relative truth to the absolute truth. There are, I think, something like over 8 million people in this country alone who've had near-death experiences in the last 50 years because they're getting resuscitated by the doctors. And so, although they're dead for a little while, they come back and have had this incredible experience. And most of, most of them say they don't want to come back. <laughs> it's too beautiful over there. <laughs> and one of the things that you learn from these near-death experiences is there's nothing to fear. And that you can know unconditional love. You can do that without dying. <laughs> and you can do that every time you sit down to meditate. I've been hearing silence for a number of years, and every time I po point my mind towards that silence, that's like a doorway into the Absolute. It's there all the time within all of us. We just have to open our hearts to it. And all of you have listened to your heart or you wouldn't be here. Because it's the thing that says there's something more. We've got to do something about ourselves. Somebody asked Reverend Master Ji Yu and he says, why am I still so angry? And she said, because you're not fed up enough. <laughs> and we have to get fed up enough to change ourselves. We have to get up, fed up enough to see what it is that we're doing that is acting on fear and greeds and doubts. And you can train your mind. You can change how it is you perceive things. But you have to be able to... Um, I'll read a paragraph here. Just a little bit. The finding of the Dharma cloud as a result of going beyond ordinary religion and climbing the glass mountain, takes those who, are, who assay it beyond isms, sex, and religious facades to that, with a capital T, that which brings total fulfillment. It is not until we are willing to go beyond our greatest fears, which ordinary religions attempt to comfort and allay, rather than teaching us to overcome them, that we are able to find the truth, that's with a capital T, Thus, we have to be willing to go beyond everything if we would be one with uh, what the Buddha and the Udana scripture calls the unborn, undying, unchanging, uncreated. This is what we should be understood by the term eternal. Kazan Zenji calls it the Lord of the House. Both of these terms are used in this book. The scriptures and the ceremonies point the way to pure meditation to Zazen which leads to the realization of the unborn, undying, unchanging. And it's up to each of us. We will know this at the time of death. But it certainly saves a lot of karma to do it sooner. <laughs> and the sooner we realize that we are creating karma, the sooner that we can change. And I want to talk about how to look at yourself. You have to be able to look at yourself with compassion. You have to be able to acknowledge that what you have done in the past was the best you could have done. If you really knew more, you would have done better. But you have to be able to look at yourself without judgment. Judgment keeps you from learning. Judgment is the conclusion. And as long as you hold on to that judgment, then there's nothing more to learn. Bad person, that's it. You have to get beyond bad person. You got to get beyond inadequacy. You have to get beyond I don't like what I see. You got to get beyond your ignorance. You have to go beyond what is familiar. 
For her, it was the vision of a glass mountain. She was not at all athletic. She's looking at this glass mountain. There's no place to hold on to. Her biggest fears are the thunderstorms on top of this mountain. <laughs> thunderstorms reminded her of World War II, where she lived through the Blitz in, in the south of London. One night she was walking along the beach and she didn't notice that there was a German plane coming and somebody just pushed her down against the seawall and the bullets went right over her head. So she was not <laughs> a great fan of the Germans. But one of the stories she was very like to tell was how this one German man who was giving people a choice uh, was not tried as a war criminal because his job was to mete out punishment for people convicted of espionage. And he had two doors in behind his desk. They were both planted, painted black. He said, this is the firing squad. I can't tell you what this one is, but you get your choice. And he wasn't tried because he had a car waiting with his engine running to take anybody with the courage across the Swiss border. And she said, this is Buddhist practice. This is Zen training. It's going through the unknown. It's going beyond what you think you know and how you perceive things. You've got to open your heart to something that's greater. And only, only you can do it for you. There's no savior here. Nobody's going to be able to do it for you. Everybody has to do it. And it's no big deal. It's just facing those things that look fearful or whatever. You know, it's public speaking. That's supposed to be one of the greatest fears. <laughs> you just have to be used to get used to making a fool of yourself. <laughs> and and, and that doesn't really matter. <laughs> and we are very foolish. And if we can't laugh at that, we're in trouble. Um, One of the things, uh, there's one man who was writing about it or talking about his near-death experiences, a man called uh, Eben uh, Alexander. And what he was able to bring back was that this unconditional love just is, exists everywhere and permeates the entire universe. It has no location, there's nowhere there, where it isn't. But that unconditional love is there within all of us. And it's only our unwillingness to open our hearts um, that keeps you from realizing it. And again, it's this shift that Yakusan had to make. And if you notice at the start of the uh, Dogen scripture called Uji about the theory of time, it's Yakusan who's telling us, you have to see everything as the Buddha. Everything is Uji. Everything is existence, time, flow. Um, Einstein looked at time and saw that, you know, it could be something different than what we're used to. <laughs> it could be a different thing. We could be, it could be our present over here, our past over here, our present over there. It could be in other places. And he called it uh, a place time because it's the con uh, conjunction of time and place that causes change, change in perception of time. And this changing our perception, this being able to look in time, requires us to look with kindness. Um, I tell, I've told this story many times, but it's the best example I have about changing perception because of being, judging yourself. Um, when I was seven, uh, I think the last of the goats died. I was uh, scared of the goats, especially the one with horns. But then my sister wanted to get a horse. The horse was ten times bigger than the goats. <laughs> and my first reaction to this horse was, whoa! <laughs> but this was a very gentle old horse, and you can ride him either English or Western. And uh, he was, He'd break into five-gated things, and, he, and we didn't know all the things he was taught to do. Um, but one day I came home, I was eight, eight years old maybe, I came home from school and nobody was home, so I thought, oh, I'll go for a ride. So I put on the bridle and I put on the saddle and I went to get on and he, he stood on the toe of my boot, not on my foot, 
just so that I couldn't move. <laughs> and I couldn't push him away, and I couldn't get away from him. Somebody later suggested I should have taken off my boot. I didn't think of that. <laughs> I just got angry. <laughs> and I reached down. I could reach this little stick, and I was hitting him on the shoulder, and I was really mad. And with great dignity, he put down one knee, then he put down the other knee, and he put his head away all the way down to the ground, and he bowed. And I could see this, literally, I could see this kind of screen coming down. This is bad person. And so I just blocked that whole thing out for 25 years. And my mother died when I was, just before I went to England, and I did the funeral for her. And then I, next week I went to, to England for a year, and I was doing the memorials for her uh, for the first 49 days. And she had been very instrumental in teaching um, respect for animals. Uh, they, they didn't, my parents didn't have kids for the first seven years or so they, uh, because it was during the Depression. And so she had a cat. And the cat had a very divine place at the table. She sat in a rocking chair. Whoever got to sit next to her got to take some meat off your plate and give it to the cat. So there was a fight every night over who gets to feed the cat. <laughs> And she was very instrumental. You could fight with your brother and sister, but you couldn't fight with the cat or the dog or the goat or the horses. <laughs> and since she had been so instrumental in this thing about respect for animals, this, this incident came up and I could see how I had judged myself as a bad person, so I couldn't learn that here the horse was bowing to me. And little boy's anger, what a perfect teaching. You know, here, here's this bodhisattva was was bowing simply because he had learned how to do this, and he was <laughs> trying to help this poor little kid. <laughs> Didn't know any better, and but the judgment kept me from learning that. And as long as we're judging ourselves, we can't get beyond the judgment. We have to let go of the judgment in order to see what how the difficulty that we're confronted with is actually an opportunity. And we don't have to avoid the difficulties, we have to open our hearts to them. And this change in perception is this all acceptance. So whatever is going on, open your heart to that. So we've had winter at this time, we haven't had this for 50 years or something. <laughs> and it's going on at great length and I'm thinking, well, it's really beautiful. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> and uh, better than the smoke. <laughs> and so it's the shift in perception. You, th you think, oh, well, it's gone on too long. Well, it hasn't gone on too long. It's, it's just going on as long as it takes. <laughs> and with the ideal comes the actual. And so what you have to recognize is that whatever is happening is the ideal. And so it's opening our heart to that. So all of that kind of criticism of somebody else or anger or whatever, training your mind has a lot to do with being able to see that you're actually holding on to a worry or a fear or a greed or an anger. And you have to recognize that and say, don't do this to yourself. Because when you do that, I was reading a Tibetan monk talking about having a conversation with, a confrontation with somebody where you get really angry at them. And then the next time you see them, you still get angry at them because you remember this. And you see somebody else and you start getting angry with them too <laughs> because you've just been angry at this guy that you didn't, didn't like. And if you can see how you're poisoning your mind with these worries and doubts and fears and you say, just don't go there. You have a choice. If you see you're acting out of this karmic conditioned reaction of anger or fear, say, look, look at yourself and say, no, I don't have to do that. I don't have to be somebody else. I just have to let go of it. She, Master, do you like the idea that we had the freeway here because it's cars going back and forth? Those are just like thoughts in the mind. And you don't have to set up a roadblock. You don't have to um, hitch a ride, but you're going to do those things. So you have to recognize 
what it is that you're, you're not doing. Meditation is mostly seeing where you're not meditating. Seeing where you, your mind is wandering, seeing where you've gotten, tried to push things away you didn't like, or you're remembering somebody, you know, your fight with somebody last week or whatever. And you've got to see what it is you're doing to your mind. And that little wake-up thing is when you're meditating. Oh, <laughs> I'm wandering down the road here. Bring yourself back. Your true home is in peace. But you have to be able to return to that true home. Listen to the silence. Listen, look at whatever helps you let the mind be still. And just keep going back to that place. Listen to the heart. The heart is absolute truth. But it whispers. <laughs> so you have to listen very carefully. <laughs> just like my weeny voice. <laughs> If I didn't have a microphone, you'd all be saying, what's this? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> you'd think I'd get used to it and speak up. <laughs> I'm working on that, too. <laughs> the, um, one of the things that came out of the Lotus Blossom, too, was her saying, not only is there nothing to fear in death, but there's nothing to fear in life. And what you have to see is, if you're fearful of something, look at what you're doing. If you're doubting about something, you don't get faith because there are no doubts. You get faith because in the midst of your doubts, you just keep practicing anyway. <laughs> it's just that simple. Just keep working on bringing yourself back to paying attention to what you're doing. Look at all the places where you're not meditating. Look at all the places where you're, you're angry or fearful or greedy or jealous or whatever. But look at them. Be aware. Be mindful of what it is that you're doing. Because when you uh, go into those things and start mulling them over, it's like drinking poison. And only you can stop doing that. But you have to see that you're doing because it affects everybody around you when you do that. Your doubts and your worries and your fears. It, it's just... It is poison, and you just don't have to drink it, and you don't have to spread it around to other people. Because it's just not helpful. But you're not doing anything bad. You're not a bad person. In fact, one of the things that Eben Alexander found was that you can do no wrong. And it's not that you can't cause harm to other people, but you'll get the karmic consequences. So if you cause harm to yourself or others, it'll come back to you. But it's not coming back. Karma doesn't do this as a punishment. It's doing us to teach. Because there's something we need to learn. And that learning process is going beyond what is familiar. Going beyond the doubts and the worries and the fears. Catching yourself in the midst of being afraid of something and say, oh, it's okay. I can let it go. I don't have to hold on to it. Because the source of the suffering is the clinging. You can cling to things that are wonderful, but the clinging turns them to suffering. And what it is, you have to see where you're clinging. You have to see the tensions. You have to be able to, to let go, to open up to that and admit, oh, I'm clinging to my worries or my doubts or my fears. And see what it is you're doing. See how silly it is. <laughs> because until we can look at that with kindness and seeing, it, oh, you know, I'm just worrying about nothing. Well, nothing is a really big concept in Buddhism. <laughs> you got to be able to be comfortable with nothing. <laughs> Sunyata is all about the emptiness of things. But you, you, anything you've done in the past, it doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't destroy your Buddha nature. It allows you to see where it is you need to put the effort, where you have to be conscious of what it is you're doing, but conscious in a kind way, conscious with humor, with um, our ability to, to open up. And that openness is what allows the Buddha nature to manifest itself. Because the 
anything we cling to is keeping us from knowing this absolute truth. And it's there all the time. That con confluence of our relative truth, our bodies, our minds, with ultimate truth, allows us to know something bigger. So use the meditation every day as an opportunity to open your heart to this, this thing that's bigger, absolute truth. And we have to experience this. Uh, one of the things that's been helpful to me is, is a book by um, a Dutch physician, uh, Pim van Lommel, who uh, he studied 10 hospitals in Holland for a number of years, every cardiac patient that had um, moments of being dead, he talked to them. And he found that uh, this is universal, this experience of absolute truth. Um, and this what the Buddha's been teaching for 2,600 years. You know, and the president of India gave him a Lifetime Achievement Award because he was so <laughs> impressed <laughs> that the Western scientists <laughs> got it. <laughs> And what it is, is he he's, makes um, this connection between quantum mechanics and absolute truth. He calls it unconditional um, consciousness, uh, non-location. This consciousness doesn't have a location. And that's the way physicists are discovering about quantum physics. Think particles can have a choice, and they'll take both of them. <laughs> um, things can um, light can be either a wave or a particle, but need not many, but they can't do both at once. Um, there are things that, when they split these particles apart, um, they can be in great distance from one another, but they'll still do exactly the same thing at the same time. There's this connection there that, for which there is no connection. <laughs> and there are things that scientists are learning about uh, quantum physics that they don't have uh, anything in the world of Newtonian physics to, to make that choice, to, to show them how to understand this. Because you have to make a leap of faith in order to understand quantum physics. <laughs> and that's what this is about. Okay? This leap of faith is going beyond what's familiar, going beyond our greeds, our angers, our fears. Um, and only we can do this. But look at the habits of, of worry. And one of the things that I think he points out, one of them points out is, look at the, uh, a school of fish, they'll all turn at the same time. Look at a flock of birds. They all take off at the same time and they never hit each other. <laughs> There's this one mind that's operating here and it's operating through a school of fish or through uh, these flock of birds. You know, how do they do that? They're not going to do it through thinking. And trying to, thinking that the brain is the source of consciousness is a complete delusion. It's not the source. The source is this Buddha mind, the absolute truth. But absolute truth lives everywhere. I'm going to try to read a little bit. I'm not a good reader. Um, but this, I've, I've read this book three or four times, and I lived through a part of it with her. I was away for part of the time, but um, it did scare a lot of people because she was going into the places where a lot of her disciples weren't ready to go to. And as one of them said, well, the, the tree is being shaken and the rotten fruit is falling off. <laughs> that was a very helpful way of looking at the people who turned away. But um, it, um, again, that's one of the things you have to go beyond. And uh, she was an amazing teacher. Okay, so this is just, 
at random here. Uh, it's called The True Being. I stay all day in a state of suspended animation. It's now evening, and the disciple who is with me, although he did not see what I did, is in the same state as I, as a result of asking questions for me. I was very frightened after I chose not to continue to go up this morning, for I started to come back down and was going into darkness. I did not wish to go into darkness. I started coming back up again and have remained suspended between darkness and light during the entire day. I am needed to do some work. Both my disciple and I feel very strange. He needs to come back. I tell him to come back, and, he re and this releases him. I know that I too must somehow come back into myself and stop standing in this column of light. I ask if this is the right thing to do, and I'm told yes through my disciple. I find myself coming back down the fifth column of light and enter the Buddha mark on my forehead. I come to rest at the center of the flower within my hara. I must not forget the words, go in and out. I am beginning to have a bad cold and not feeling well. I do not wish to take any more spiritual journeys for a little. But it's obvious that I'm going to continue. <laughs> During the night, I'm conscious of sitting still in the center of the golden lotus. The doors are open to the world, and the golden light streams out of them. That which is standing in the center of the golden flower is now the newborn Buddha, with one hand pointing up, the other down. He is standing in the center of the column of light, which has entered my head, and this column is in the center of the golden flower. The column is the baby Buddha. Excuse me. The column and the baby Buddha smelt, melt into a diamond nui, which is exactly the shape of my spine. It changes into a lotus blossom, and then to a lotus pod, then to a bud, into a dragon with five whiskers that curl up and become the five columns of ascending light, and into the ele an elephant with five tusks that curl up into these same five columns. It constantly changes from one to another. I understand that sometimes I am the diamond scepter, which penetrates the universe. Sometimes I am the lotus blossom. Sometimes I pour out the seeds of the Dharma. Sometimes I am the new blossom, and at other times a new bud. Sometimes I am the defender of the faith, and sometimes I am holy. And all of these things find their root in the center of the golden lotus within my hara. I am very frightened that I cannot bend because of the rigidity of the diamond scepter. The diamond scepter just cannot bend, and the baby Buddha still stands within the golden lotus. As I move, the diamond scepter becomes the lotus, and I am able to bend. The stem is always flexible. I stay thus until morning. The five columns come out sometimes from the Buddha mark on my forehead, and sometimes from the five points of the golden crown or lotus upon my head. At other times, they form the column at the base of which is the baby Buddha. I know now the meaning of all five. They truly are the aspects of the monk. The first is earth, penetrating heaven. The second, the knot of eternity. The third, heaven, penetrating earth. The fourth, the putting on of the golden kesa, which is within the fountain of the Buddha's wisdom. The bathing within this radiance. The fifth, the ability to die while sitting and standing, which transcends both peasant and sage, and the right to go to heaven or hell if the intention is right, to help all living things. My wish for now is just to be a monk.